Welcome Bailey to Worth Wellness TV. I am really excited selfishly to have you on here because of the phase of life I'm in and everyone knows like I'm due in August. And so finding your books was totally serendipitous in that I had never heard of you prior to like browsing my library and found your feng shui mommy book on the shelf and thought, Oh, this looks so interesting. I actually loved the cover art. That's actually what drew me to it. I was like, that looks so peaceful and blissful. So I picked it up and it was just so different from all the like labor preparation books and very technical stuff I was reading Mm -hmm. because you do provide a lot of really good info in that book, but it was also you're just such an engaging writer and really funny. Like I connected well with your sense of humor. I was like, okay, I have to find more from Bailey. So welcome to the show. I think the viewers are going to love it just as much as I do. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Mm. Well, and your second book specifically, um, is just like an amazing resource for all of those things. If you've never been pregnant before, or maybe you have had this experience that you think, oh, this is so odd. Like, I don't want to talk about it because maybe I'm the only one that has this going on. It's just so comforting to know someone's like willing to, to go there. So I'm curious if you could share about the second book, what prompted you to write it and yeah, like what inspired its birth? Yeah. So asking for a pregnant friend, the idea for that probably came up, you know, when I was pregnant with my son now, gosh, almost 10 years ago. And I had so many questions that made me really embarrassed. Some that made me feel, you know, shame. And I didn't ask anybody, any of the questions. The only person I asked was Google (laughs) and, you know, for the more medical questions, I got really confusing information. A lot of the information kind of contradicted, you know, one, one website would contradict the other. And then for the more, you know, emotional, social questions, really the only answers I found were on like chat rooms and that kind of thing. And the answers, the information was really judgmental and just intensified that shame. So I felt, you know, really alone. I kind of just shoved all of the questions down. And then, you know, when I was decided, when I decided to get pregnant with my daughter, which took a long time, but during that process, you know, our, our culture had shifted, you know, more taboo topics were, were coming out into the light. There was so much more acceptance around that. And I figured, okay, well, we need to do that for the topics around pregnancy, childbirth, early motherhood. Mm-hmm. So I took, you know, all those questions that I had had, and then all of those questions that I had received from parents over the years from teaching childbirth preparation, from being a doula, a writer, I've gotten so many questions. And so many women specifically, you know, because um, would start it almost always with, I'm really embarrassed to ask this, but, mm-hmm. and so those are, you know, all the questions that went into this book. And as I was writing it, I decided, okay, if I want this to be helpful, I really have to go there. I have to be vulnerable. I have to share all of my stuff. So other people feel comfortable, hopefully doing the same. Yeah. Which I think, I mean, you read it and we know, you know, authors, a lot of the times share their personal stories, but if I put myself in your shoes, I'm thinking some of these things I've experienced too, like only my husband has ever heard me talk about it. Like, I can't even imagine even telling my sister or my mom, like, which is so weird, especially, I mean, my mom, she birthed three kids, but like, I've never heard any of this talked about by that generation, especially. And I don't know. Yeah. We're kind of in a different world. So around more, I'm not around on a daily basis, a bunch of pregnant ladies with me. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to try to navigate that. And I am so thankful you were willing to open up about your experience and give women a place to land too. Oh, be their you. pregnant friend so that they're looking yeah. for. Yes, right, exactly. So can you tell us what you do? I know you're a writer, but what, what does it look like for you as far as how you're involved in helping women with birth and pregnancy and all of that? Yeah, yeah. So certainly, you know, a huge part of my job, you know, as you said, is is writing on the topic. You know, I'm right, write the books. Uh, I write for different women's magazines, websites about these topics, Um, but I also teach childbirth preparation. So um, I've been teaching hypnobirthing 
gosh, since my son was about six months old. I've been doing that for a long time. Um, I, after I'm a doula as well. So I attend births. And after doing that for a long time, I shifted how I teach a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. after seeing all of the different ways that, you know, women experience birth and all the different things that can be helpful. So kind of have my own spin on, on hypnobirthing, but yeah, so I would say about 50% is teaching, being with women at births. And then the other part of it is, yeah, writing about all of it and my, and my personal experiences. So with your son, cause I know you said he was about six months when you started, uh, when you looked into hypnobirthing and becoming actually certified in teaching that what prompted that? Did you have an experience with your son in birth that was a hypnobirthing type of experience or was it very different? Yeah. So my, my mom, she actually became certified to teach hypnobirthing about five years before I became pregnant with my son. She um, worked in, you know, fertility, IVF, and, oh, and that's something else I totally forgot when I was talking about my work. Um, I also own an egg donor agency that I I took over from her and her business partner. So I'm in the kind of fertility realm as well, Um, Graceful Beginnings Egg Donation. And so it's so funny how my life has just been following my mother's. Um, (laughs) Talk about turning into your mother. Um, So So she became certified and it never actually ended up teaching. She ended up again, opening her agency, but I became really interested in it. I started using some of the fear release tools, the meditations, and just really resonated with the philosophy. So when I became pregnant, it just felt like the natural fit. Um, And I'll be honest, when I became pregnant with my son, even though I knew about hypnobirthing, I had still been so conditioned to believe that there's no way that I can get through childbirth without an epidural, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what everybody Mm -hmm. tells me. The one exception being my mom. And so I went into the childbirth prep thinking like, okay, I'll practice all of this, but it's probably not going to let me have an unmedicated birth. Like, let's be honest. So I, you know, do really lean into all of the, you know, the fear release, all of it. And I will not say that my hospital, it was a hospital birth with my son. Um, I will not say that it was free of any discomfort, but I was able to have an unmedicated birth because, because of hypnobirthing, you know, those tools, the techniques that I learned in that class, I feel is absolutely what gave me really the mental strength, you know, um, to, to move through that process without the medication. And I, and I tell women that take the class, it's like, look, this is not just for women that want an unmedicated birth. All of these tools, they help you stay calm, regardless of if you need Pitocin, an epidural, even a C-section, right? Um, so again, it's not just for the unmedicated birth, but I was a believer after I had the experience myself. And I think my son was about four weeks old when I started researching how to become certified. I just um, loved it. And that passion just snowballed into what, what I do today. Thank you for sharing that because I... I think maybe even just a couple of years ago before I dove r- deeper into meditation and personal development and all that kind of more spiritual type stuff, mm-hmm. I, I would have been kind of one of those people when I heard about like a hypno birth or like, first of all, it was really on the fringe. So you didn't really hear about it, but a couple of stories you might maybe heard. It's kind of like, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, it's kind of like, you just yeah. questioned it. Like, can you really be serious? Like what, what's really happening? Mm-hmm. And now with so much more information, I think there's slowly this curiosity starting to peak in women. If like, is there another way to experience labor and birth Mm -hmm. that's different from like what we're seeing and what we see in the media um, and all those horror birth stories. And so I think it helps when someone has experienced it, like you, like to be able to share from that experience, like, no, it's not that it's not uncomfortable, but it can, it can really change the game. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we'll start, I want to start with kind of walking through each phase because there's a lot of really good questions you cover in the book and we will get to more birthing questions because I have them (laughs) for sure. But if we were to start with pregnancy, one of the things that was so crazy before I even knew that I was pregnant, uh, it was 
right before Christmas, I found out on Christmas Eve and I have a stepson who's six and he was on Christmas break already. And I noticed that I was just not my, I didn't feel like myself in that the smallest things. I mean, now looking back on it, they didn't feel small at the time, but like, I just felt like a rage monster. I felt like I was so angry and like, I am not a yeller. And I just like lost it the whole week when he's on Christmas break. And I was like, that is so weird. No one had ever told me that that could be a symptom that you were pregnant. I just thought I was like losing my mind. So I, I love that you talk a lot about like the emotional experience as well. And I would love if you could kind of talk, speak to like, what is going on for women in that? And what are some of the strategies we can employ to help feel a little bit more grounded? Cause I think there's a side of it that I've enjoyed being pregnant and feeling really like in tune with the emotional experience of life. But then there's other moments where it feels just so intense and you're like, I can't turn this off, but I kind of wish I could. So yeah. yeah. Could you speak to that question? Yeah. So that, that irritability, or as you said, sometimes like we feel like that rage monster, uh, there is a few things happening. So of course, one of the big things is hormones, right? You know, specifically that shift in estrogen and progesterone can, uh, increase, you know, anxiety, irritation, our, our moodiness, you know, so, so hormones are a huge, huge part of that. Um, in addition to that, we're going through a massive life change, right? Even if we desperately wanted to become pregnant and we're so incredibly happy about it, we're still, again, physically in the moment going through changes. We're also looking forward at how is my life going to change once the baby is here? If, you know, we have a partner, whether it be, you know, a man, a woman, whomever, they're going through a lot of changes as well. And so they might be also a little bit more irritating than they usually are, or they might just really easily trigger you. So, and and then again, same for children. If you have, you know, your, your stepson for me, you know, my son who was present during my, my last pregnancy, you know, there's so many personalities that are tricky enough to navigate, right. When we're not pregnant, but when we're pregnant, it is so much harder to, again, smoothly navigate all of the the relationships around us. So, so what to do? (sighs) Number one, realizing what our triggers are is really helpful. So we can start looking at, okay, what, what's happening when I do turn into this rage monster? And, and it's okay if it's something that seems insignificant, you know, if it's like, oh, and my husband like leaves a sock on the floor or whatever, it doesn't matter that that's a little thing you you're starting to notice, okay, what is it that sets me off? And when you see that trigger, when you feel like, okay, it's coming on to just be really honest with whoever you're with. It's like, look, I'm feeling triggered. And even if you do feel like it's their fault, you can say it's, it's not your fault. It's pregnancy. I need to go uh, take a moment to myself. It's for my, my own good and yours as well. You know, so again, just to be honest about how we're feeling instead of trying to pretend that, okay, like I don't feel irritated. I don't feel mad. It's like, well, you do in that moment. And there's nothing wrong with that. But of course, when those triggers turn into an argument with someone we love or treating someone we love in a way that doesn't feel good to us, it just makes us feel worse. It makes them feel worse. So again, to say, I'm feeling triggered. I need some alone time. That's a big one. Mm-hmm. And the obvious one that, you know, we always talk about, but just that self-care, right. You know, doing everything you can to sleep at least somewhat well, which can be hard when we're pregnant, uh, you know, the eating well, um, a really easy thing is drinking lots of water, but especially when you feel triggered because those stressor hormones that start to flow through us when we feel triggered react to water. So when we are drinking lots and lots of water, we're helping to even flush out some of those stressor hormones. And then mentally you can tell yourself every sip of water I take is is minimizing my irritability is, is helping to wash away my anger, you know, so it can become that, you know, have a mind body connection with drinking that water. So really simple little things like that, but 
recognizing and, and telling yourself every morning, okay, these are a few things that I can do when I feel triggered and then actually working the plan. You know, it's so easy to give in to our rage because sometimes it can actually feel good in the moment and like relieving to just like go off on somebody. But obviously like after a couple of minutes of it, we, we don't feel good. So mm -hmm. honoring, honoring how you're feeling and stepping away, having that private time. And then when you're having that private time to again, nurture yourself as much as you can. Yeah. And I think it's, it's complex, like in what I have experienced, because mm -hmm. First of all, there's, there's this heightened sensitivity to what people are doing around you. Like say with your spouse, like for me, for my husband, and I don't know beforehand, I would have probably let, I was just more the personality where I would bury things deep mm -hmm. until it just kind of became like too many things. And then I, you know, unleash <laughs> like sort of thing. Yeah, totally. But since I've been pregnant, I feel like there's this, maybe it's because there's so many emotions. I have to stay current. And mm -hmm. so it can feel like I'm always, there's always a problem, <laughs> like with my husband, like right. I'm always bringing up something you're doing that's wrong because I'm like super sensitive and now everything's wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of also, I think finding that balance of sometimes maybe it is just, you need to take a step away and take a break for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then other times navigating those conversations, because I also feel right. that there's so much, there can be a lot of pressure on the relationship because all of a sudden what worked maybe for the two of you, now mm -hmm. you're thinking about how is this going to work if he keeps doing this or whatever, once we have a baby, like if it's, right. if we perceive that they're not considering us mm -hmm. or the baby or things like that, right. that can make us then afraid. Like we've partnered with this person, but you know, what kind of father are they going to be? Like, it's really easy to go there. So how- right. How would you say someone would be helpful for someone to navigate that balance between knowing when it's worth a conversation? Is it okay to have it all be a conversation? Right. Because um, I definitely, <laughs> I, my husband's been super gracious about it, but I also feel like I'm just always saying like, that's wrong. You can't do that <laughs> like, right, sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's two, mm -hmm. two things I would say. So the first thing, you know, when you are taking that pause, when you're feeling really triggered after you take some deep breaths and, and researchers have found that it takes about 90 seconds for an emotion to move through us. So go and just breathe for 90 seconds. You can even time yourself. And typically after that time, if you just allow that motion to move, the yeah, emotion to move through you, you're able to think a little bit more rationally. And so when that happens, you can look at the trigger, like what was said to you, what, what did this person do and, and think, okay, is this really not that big of a deal to me and something that is just triggering this emotion because I'm, I'm pregnant, I'm just feeling extra irritable, or is this something that they do a lot and it really does irritate me. And I really do need to have a conversation with them about it. Or of course, if they said something that was hurtful and you're like, okay, well, that's really not okay. You know, this is something that warrants a conversation. This is not me just being irritable because I'm pregnant. This is legitimately something that again, deserves a conversation. So you can do two things then, you know, you can, if you're feeling calm, you can go and approach them about it. It's like, okay, you know, I'm sorry. I, I needed a minute. I'm feeling more calm. I would like to discuss, you know, X, Y, and Z. Ideally, you know, it's a good time. It's not like when they're running off to work or, you know, something where you really can't get into a conversation, which let's be real. A lot of times in life, that's, that's what's happening, you know? So in that situation, especially during pregnancy, I recommend that couples find about one time a week, a time where they're well-rested, they've eaten some healthy food. They don't have somewhere to be in like an hour. You can really just settle in together and, and no, it's like, okay, we're going to sit down together and, and not just discuss things or that are bugging us about one another, but have a well-rounded conversation, you know, so you can even make the conversation like a compliment sandwich, right? So you can both start out by just like saying like a couple things that you're grateful for, which can feel cheesy in the beginning. I, I know, but it helps. I mean, it's amazing what an impact it can have when we tell somebody what we do love about them and how it really can 
open up their, their receptivity to, you know, some constructive criticism. So start the conversation with like, okay, let's just acknowledge what we love about each other and with, without any buts. So not like, I love that you do this, but if you would just do it this way, you know, just, just that gratitude. And then, and I recommend both of you coming with a list of the things you're grateful for, but also jot down the things that you want to discuss. So the conversation doesn't just digress into, you know, some topic that really isn't as important to discuss. So you can really stay on topic. If each of you get to share, okay, these are some triggers I've had, some things that I, I would like to look at and see how we can, you know, make some adjustments. And then if you can, end the conversation again with a few more things that you love about each other and even a hug because it's amazing how that physical contact can really help to to settle the nervous system and make you feel reconnected with that person who you might have felt it at odds with 15 minutes before so having that that weekly conversation is really helpful on a somewhat side note um something that can also be helpful is making one of those conversations a conversation around how you're going to delegate child care because that's a big stressor mm -hmm. for both parents, you know, that a lot of times we shockingly, we don't talk about that much until the child is actually here, you know, so to write down together all of the tasks you think you'll need to get done during at least the baby's like first um, year of life, and then talk about, okay, I'm going to do this. You're going to do that. We're going to share this responsibility. And I tell women, it's like, make sure that your name isn't next to 75% of the tasks, especially if you're working, right? You know, a lot of times now in a lot of households the both partners are working really hard, you know, so you shouldn't have to be doing, you know, two thirds of all of the work with the child and the house care and whatever. So that's something else that can just help to reduce those, those stressors and that kind of like irritation that you both might have and not really know what it's from. A lot of times it's just the stress of like, what is it going to look like when this baby's here? This conversation can really help. And maybe there was expectations we had in our head, but we never spoke them. So now, I mean, it, it is, I mean, not only is there so much going on physically postpartum, but then to have that not yet talked about, not yet like discussed is just another <laughs> stressor for sure. So really? I think yeah. that's a great thing to think about in advance yeah. and a great way to bring your partner more into the experience too, because as the mm -hmm. one, you know, growing the baby, like you're thinking about it all the time. Like it's a constant, not only after birth, but I'm thinking of all the things that need to happen before yeah. the baby comes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can feel like that that amount of just emotional labor is not shared and there can be some resentment there. So I think a conversation like this is helpful to kind of bring them into that. Like you're part of this too. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other suggestions for women who are feeling kind of bef like before birth resentful maybe of their spouse, not seeming to be as invested because I mean, they can't, they can't feel the kicks. They're not the one like always thinking about it. Like, like mm -hmm. we are. So mm -hmm. I, and then maybe from your own experience too, if you could share with your husband, like what were some things you guys did to help bring him into that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things that, that I did that, that helped a lot. The first thing we did was I told him what it was like to be pregnant, you know, mm. because I always assumed he should have like all this empathy. He should just know. But I realized, well, if I've never actually told him, you know, what I'm going through, how is he supposed to know? How is he supposed to have the, the empathy that I want him to have? Um, not as much with my pregnancy with my son, because it was just so easy. Like I was so much younger. I was just a breeze. I was like, oh, being pregnant is great. Uh, with my daughter, it was a very traditional pregnancy. Um, and so and I felt really almost mad at him that he like didn't always feel like he was going to vomit and could sleep without soaking the sheets in sweat and just like all of this stuff. I was so mad at him. And in so any I position started, he wants, you know, you could yeah. sleep in however you okay. want. Yeah. How dare you? How dare yeah. you be so comfortable? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so that helped, you know, and I, and I tried to come at it, not from like, like, you don't know what it's like. I, I tried to make sure like, okay, I'm feeling calm when I tell him. And I, and I prefaced it by saying, you know, I I'm feeling like I just 
I need some more empathy from you and some more like practical support for what I'm going through. And so this is what it's like. And here is what you can actually do. Cause mm -hmm. sometimes partners like, okay, great. That's how you're feeling, but how can I actually support you? Um, so to tell them straight up, like how you can support me in regards to, you know, feeling that connection to the baby. Um, so one thing we teach in hypnobirthing is prenatal bonding for, for both, you know, mother and father, um, or mother, mother, father, father, whomever it is. And one of the big things is, and, and it sounds so simple, but just that, that daily connection with the baby. So to have both parents, you know, come together, sit on the couch, have the partner, you know, touch the belly, talk to the baby and, from a practical sense, the more that the baby can hear the voices of both parents and babies in utero around 20 weeks gestation, they, they can hear you. So it's not just like this energetic thing. They can actually hear you. And so the more that they hear the voices of both parents, the more bonded that they, the more bonded they'll feel to both parents. So having that, that daily pause together, it can even just be five minutes like before you watch a show or right after dinner or right before bed, just sit together, have the partner, you know, rub the belly, talk to the baby, just that little bit of physical touch and connection can be so great for, for the baby. So great for the partner to help them feel just a little bit more connected. And for the mom as well, because you feel like, okay, like they care, we're in this together. You know, when you see them putting that focus on the belly. Um, and I love to tell moms like, okay, your homework is to have your partner give you a foot rub or a, a shoulder rub every single night to, to help to learn like those pressure points or what feels good to you. So then they can do it during labor. And, and yes, it's good preparation for labor, but it's also, again, just yet another quiet moment to check in, to connect. Um, another prenatal bonding exercise that I really love is writing letters. So mm -hmm. both parents can do this, but it can be really, really helpful for the partner that's not pregnant to, to write a letter, to write a letter to the baby about how they're feeling right now. Like, what is it like? You know, cause that makes you really pause and drop into this experience, not just like all of the to do's, right? Like, okay, I need to build the crib next week. I need to do this. I need to do that. But it's like, no, no, how, how am I feeling about this? So like, what does this mean to me in a, in a larger sense? Um, and then you can also write, you know, a letter to the baby for the future. Like, these are my hopes and dreams for you. So it's just a way again, for them to step out of the to do's and drop into just the beautiful sacred journey of of pregnancy, birth, and then entering um, parenthood. Mm -hmm. I love that. I, I will say for me, we, for me and my husband, it just works to do it before bed because we're both there and quiet and no, yeah. no distractions, right. but I feel so connected to my partner when he's talking to the baby. Yeah. And like, when I feel the baby respond with kicks and little mm -hmm. movements, like yeah. that is, that means the world to me. Like I, it means so much to me. So I agree. I mean, it's, it maybe is five minutes. It's really not that long, but yeah, it does make a huge difference in feeling like they're a part of this process. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I love that. And I haven't done the letters, but I think that's a really beautiful yeah. way as well. Yeah. And so it's kind of funny because I, I feel like the relationship, the impact of of a pregnancy on a relationship isn't talked about a lot, but it goes through so many different changes and phases and all of that. We, we think about like how to grow the healthy baby and marking, you know, all the weeks in pregnancy and each thing that happens at each week. But right. really, I mean, especially for me, I had a very sick first trimester as well. Like that really impacted our relationship, like specifically like your sex life can change drastically. Like, and then you move into the second trimester and there's, you know, now you're bigger. So there's like all these different things as well. Mm -hmm. So I, and no one really talked to me about like even the changes that would occur from like a desire standpoint or libido or things like that in pregnancy. So until I experienced it and then dug in a little deeper, like, oh, is this normal? Is this what happens? Like, um, I, I didn't really know what to expect. So could you talk about how that component often changes in pregnancy and what people can do if they're 
if they're just noticing changes and feeling kind of overwhelmed by that as well, whether that's like super high libido or want nothing to do with sex all of a sudden now that they're pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it, it was funny. I have a a pregnant friend as well. Who's like only a week or like a week apart on our journeys. Mm -hmm. And so we would, I I was really thankful to have her because we would text back and forth. Like, is this how you're feeling? Like this week, I hate my husband. What's going on (laughs) or whatever. So this week I'm totally into it. So yeah, I, I would love if you could speak more to that piece as well. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of the big reasons why there's so many sex questions in the book. Like I didn't expect (laughs) to have so many, but when I look back, it's like, wow, there's a lot about sex, sexuality, intimacy. Um, yeah. So as you kind of mentioned, there's a few ways that, you know, we can experience this. So some women almost immediately, you know, they have this increase in libido. They're so turned on, like everything turns them on. And a lot of times, again, back to the hormones, this is thanks somewhat to the hormones, you know, our blood volume can increase by 50% during pregnancy. So it means we just have like more blood pumping through us. The breasts are more tender, you know, so physically, you know, you can just be primed to be just more turned on. However, as you also mentioned, like for you, for myself as well, during that first trimester, you felt really sick and nothing can kill intimacy, like feeling like you're going to vomit. Right. So it's really normal to, you know, go through, it, it can even be like trimester to trimester or even day to day. Right. Like one day feeling super turned on the next day feeling like, Oh, like the idea of sex is awful. Um, and so to know number one, that that could happen. And just because, you know, you're really turned on for a couple of weeks, doesn't mean that that will last and vice versa, you know, don't be alarmed. If you suddenly feel completely unattracted to your husband, you know, or your, your partner and just tell them, don't take it personal. (laughs) It's pregnancy. Like don't panic. I'm sure I'll get back to, you know, feeling really connected to you, you know, on that intimate level. Um, so to know it's going to change, but to also know that you are allowed to honor how you are feeling. So some women feel like, okay, for the sake of my relationship, I just have to push through it, do whatever I can. And, and yeah, of course it can be important sometimes to, you know, say we haven't had sex in seven months. Like, yeah, maybe we want to push through a little bit of physical discomfort to figure out how we can reconnect on an intimate level. But if you're feeling like, you know, if you give yourself some number, like, okay, we have to have sex two times a week. But if you're feeling really, really sick all week, you you don't need to put that, that kind of pressure on, on yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I'll say, you know, okay, so if you're always feeling really turned on, that's easier, right? Like you're going to find times to, to take care of that either by yourself or with your partner. So don't have to worry as much about, about those women that just always feel really turned on. Um, and in the book, you know, I do have a lot of suggestions for positions and all that kind of stuff, um, to make it more comfortable for you. But for the women that are feeling so disconnected from their sexuality and so uninterested in in sex with their partner and they're feeling not great about that they're feeling like i i would like to get back to to that connection um to start to get creative and experiment with what feels good for me now, because your body is changing in so many ways. And even postpartum, what felt good to you before you were pregnant might not feel good to you anymore after you've had a baby. So to just start to explore again, like new positions, new way of being touched, you know, maybe you need to spend a little bit more time in the beginning, just fostering that kind of emotional connection with your partner. Mm -hmm. So to just get curious and, and to know, take heart that you will find your way back to having this really beautiful, intimate relationship, but it just might take some trial and error and it might take some time. So don't beat yourself up. If you have kind of this like awkward sexual encounter with your partner and you're not destined to, (laughs) to have a life of those, like you're just finding your, I don't even want to say your new normal, but, um, just like, again, the new things that excite you, that, that turn you on and to build, build on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think 
for myself, it was definitely this, I didn't want to force it to have some sort of like, I don't know. I didn't want to have that association with it. So it was, it was better for me in the first trimester to just let it be very infrequent. Yeah, and, cool. and, and, and my partner was like super okay with that as yeah. well. And I, I think the honoring what you do feel and then, but if you do desire for it to be different, do a little bit of exploring because maybe yeah. there is something you can come to that feels yeah. that still feels good. Right. Um, and honoring that. So yeah, I think that's a beautiful, and to be clear, neither me and my friend hated our husbands at any point of this, but <laughs> it's like that extreme, like one minute you feel this one minute, you feel that kind of thing. Right. Like right. just right. so, so normal to, and, and helpful to normalize, like you're not alone in feeling that yeah. as well. Um, so going into birthing questions, if we kind of follow, follow the journey, yeah. I would love, because I know you work a lot with women with hypnobirthing. Yeah. And I had heard of that. And then more recently, this whole like huge conversation around this idea of orgasmic birth yeah. came <laughs> up. And I I've heard a lot of hypnobirthing techniques are a part of it. So I'm, I would love if you could kind of explain how they're different, how they're similar and like what it even is. Cause when mm -hmm. I first heard of it, I was just like, what, what are you talking about? That just sounds crazy. Like, are we actually having orgasms while giving yeah. birth? How is that even possible? Right, um, right. The other thing I think is so crazy about this is I'm reading, um, one of the, I can't even think of the title, but one of the main books that you can read on this mm -hmm. is how, like, do you tell people you're doing this? Like, I mean, I'm like, I don't know that this is something people, like a lot of the people in my space, cause I was, I was grew up so conservative and all that. I don't know that they could even handle if I were to right. tell them this is my birthing approach. <laughs> I'm like yeah. what? Yeah. So horrified. Right. So thankfully my partner is on board with it, but even that, I wonder if for some women, their partners might be like, well, what are you talking about? Like, that is so crazy. So could you dive into that? Help, help us understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I'm so lucky. I feel like I'm so much more knowledgeable on this now. Um, so Deborah Pascali Bonero, who is the one that created the documentary Orgasmic Birth, she wrote the book on it. Um, she has become, you know, um, somebody that I, she's not like a close personal friend, but I was able to interview her vice versa. Mm -hmm. Like I've gotten to, you know, really get deeper into her amazing knowledge about this. Um, so I feel so lucky about that. And I wrote about it in the book, which really, really helped me educate myself because yeah, same thing. I was like, yeah, right. Nobody's having an orgasm during labor, whatever. Um, and so when I dug deeper into it, so if you're thinking about orgasmic birth in that more literal sense, right, that like somebody is literally having orgasms during birth, um, it is possible. It is possible. There is like a small percentage of women that do actually have orgasms during birth. Um, and I will get into like how to increase your chance of that happening, but to also know that some of that is also just genetic. Like some mm. women, it's just a little bit easier for them to have an orgasm. And some women experience pain and pleasure a little bit different than, than most of us. So the thing with an orgasmic birth, it's like this, this woman is kind of like vacillating between pain and pleasure. And she uses, you know, a lot of the tools that I'm going to go into to like tip into pleasure. But a lot of times because of genetics, she's already a little bit more predisposed mm -hmm. to be able to tip into pleasure. So I tell people that, so they don't think, I did all the stuff that Bailey told me and like, I'm not having orgasms. And what I tell those women is, okay, just because you're not having orgasms, it doesn't mean you can have an or doesn't mean you can't have an orgasmic birth. And what I mean by that is the way that I view orgasmic birth is a birth that is filled with purpose and passion and some pleasure. It might not be an orgasm, but you're feeling pleasure, at least in parts of it. And I also like to note that even if a woman is having some orgasms during labor, it doesn't mean that she's not having any discomfort. Mm -hmm. You know, she could have one contraction that is incredibly intense in a not fun way. And then 20 minutes later, have an orgasm. So it's not just either, or either you're having mm -hmm. a lot of pain or a lot of pleasure. You know, a lot of women are kind of flowing between the two. And so, you know, how, how to prepare for that kind of birth. So so you asked 
a while ago, like how the two kind of relate like hypnobirthing and orgasmic birth. So they complement each other really, really well because hypnobirthing is all about reprogramming the mind to think of birth in really beautiful, positive terms. So mm -hmm. our culture, sadly, a lot of times fills our mind with really fearful, really inaccurate ideas about labor. When the reality is, is that for a lot of women, it's a very normal, natural, organic process, um, albeit sure one that we're not experiencing all the time, which is why it can trigger, you know, that uncertainty, that fear. Um, but when you use something like hypnobirthing or any kind of childbirth prep philosophy that helps you kind of explore, okay, how do I feel about birth and how do I want to feel about birth? And then utilizing things like, like meditation affirmations to just really fill your mind with those beautiful, positive messages about birth. That's going to make it easier to have an orgasmic birth. Also utilizing the tools that you learn in a childbirth prep class, like something as simple as breathing. Mm -hmm. getting into comfortable positions, doing everything you can to make your body as comfortable as possible. You also need to feel safe. If you want any chance of actually having an orgasm during labor, if you say, if your mother-in-law makes you feel really uncomfortable and she's sitting in the corner of the room, you're not going to be having any orgasms. So to give yourself permission to say, you know, during labor at different phases, like the only person I want in the room is my partner, or I, I need total privacy. And for some women, when they need that, I help them go to the bathroom and they just sit in a dark bathroom, which can actually be really soothing for, for a lot of women. Um, and then the last one, which won't be a surprise, and this one is one that can make, when I say it, some women are like, oh, no, I would never do that. Um, clitoral stimulation, right? It's the way a lot of women have orgasm, orgasms normally. And, and they're like, yeah, but it's like, I'm giving birth. Like, isn't that weird to like combine the two? And okay, look, your, your baby's not gonna know what you're doing. And, and I tell women to think of it not as some sexual thing that you're doing, but as a way to release endorphins in your body. So you can just shift how you think about that action into this is just like a really effective pain relief tool for childbirth, which it, which it is. And you don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to tell a soul that that's what you're doing. You can go into the bathroom and just try it. Just see like, does this like release some endorphins in me? If so, great. I can keep doing this for a little bit. You don't have to tell your partner. Again, your baby doesn't know. Your baby's not going to tell anybody. So it can be just this, you know, very private mm -hmm. thing that you do. But that honestly is probably one of the most effective tools for having an orgasm during, during labor. Mm -hmm. I think that is super helpful and realizing it's not going to probably be all one or all the other, like all pain for all pleasurable, even if you are aiming for an orgasmic birth, you probably will like, it's, you're not doing it wrong. If you're fluctuating between the two, I think that's helpful, um, to just like not expect of yourself, something that may not be like realistic. Yeah. Um, as far as preparing do, do you think there are things that directly, cause I haven't even had, I've never given birth before. So I'm asking two for myself, yeah. a lot of, I hear people talk about how you can't actually prepare for birth because you don't know what it's going to be like. And everybody's experience is so different. Yeah. But then here we have all these things like you, sh you should do to prepare, to have the kind of birth you want. So yeah. like, where's, what kind of things are actually like, should we be practicing certain sort of things that will directly translate or is it kind of just, we're practicing all the tools and we hope we're able to utilize them in birth. Like, it's kind of like, we hope for the best. Is that really the best right. we can do? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? That's a good question. So, okay. One of the, <laughs> one of the first things that I tell people in my classes, it's like, okay, if all that you learn in this class is how to breathe deeply, then your, your birth is going to be like 95% easier. So breathing honestly is one of the, the best things that we can do. And it sounds like easy, right? When we're just sitting here and not giving birth, like, yeah, <laughs> birth is easy. Um, when you're in labor, it, it's a little bit more challenging. So, so, you know, 
and finding a childbirth prep course that you resonate with or some good books that you resonate with and actually practicing those tools, that's really helpful because then you're gonna learn probably a couple of different breathing techniques. And so I tell women practice those, like find breathing techniques that you, that feel good in your body and do those as much as possible, just to program yourself to start taking deeper breaths, especially if you're feeling uncomfortable. Like if in your first trimester, you're feeling really nauseous, practice breathing through that discomfort. If you stub your toe, practice, you know, sure you can like drop some F-bombs, but then start to take some deep breaths, you know, so really lean on that. Breathing is key and not just thinking like, yeah, no, I know how to breathe deeply. I'll just do that when it comes, but no, really start to program yourself now and to set the intention that when I'm having those contractions, because I have seen women do this and it's so natural when we first start to have stronger contractions, we actually like kind of hold our breath. And literally I've seen women like lean away from their abdomen. And that's what we do a lot of times when we experience something uncomfortable, we're like, Ooh, ow, that hurts. But instead to like, literally like lean into it, to lean forward if you can and force yourself to breathe. That is one of the most effective ways to really like burst past that wall of discomfort and, and find some relief. So breathing is a huge thing. Something that I teach in my classes. I think I wrote, I did, I wrote about it in both of my books. It's called the perineal tissue massage. And this is, it's not really a massage. It's more of like a perineal stretching exercise because it can be a little uncomfortable, but it's so effective. So essentially you are helping the perineum to become more elastic. So you're not just like stretching it, but you're helping it learn how to be more soft and flexible. So as the baby's head is coming out, that area where, you know, if we're going to tear, it's in, it's the perineum that, that tears during childbirth and doing this perineal tissue massage significantly reduces your chances of tearing, or at least of having a, a significant tear. And it can actually make that phase of labor when the baby is coming out um, a little bit more comfortable. And it helps to train your mind to believe that a baby can actually come out of me because as you become more comfortable with the perineum and you tell yourself, okay, I am doing something tangible to prepare my body for labor. I'm not, I'm preparing my mind, which is great, but I'm also literally preparing my body to have the baby come out. So honestly, it is one of the most effective things you can do. I, I did it religiously when I was pregnant with my son. I had a pretty like mild tear. I didn't even feel it. I was on no medication, didn't even know that I tore with my daughter, I was so busy. I completely forgot to do it. I probably told 25 women in classes when I was pregnant to start doing it completely spaced out, never did it on my own. Um, and granted with this labor, I had a home birth with midwives and my daughter came out really fast. Um, mm -hmm. But I had a more significant tear and I'll bet it's because I did not do the perineal tissue massage. Mm -hmm. Um, those are two of the, the big ones. And one, uh, I could go on forever and ever and ever about this, but another big one that I want to mention is making sure that you feel incredibly comfortable with your medical care provider, whether that be an OBGYN, a midwife, you want to make sure that that person makes you feel really, really safe and comfortable because, and I've seen it so many times, a woman has that primary care provider that just makes them feel like they're like a little kid in trouble, you know, like they just have to say yes to everything this um, authority figure is telling them to do and they don't feel safe to um, speak up. They don't feel empowered around that person. And I understand, I know it is so uncomfortable to essentially like fire a medical care provider during pregnancy and find a new one. I know that this is not like a simple, easy request, but it can make such a big difference. To, to tune in to how safe you feel with that person. If you're like, I don't feel that comfortable with them. Not, not that like you think that they're dangerous or anything, but you just don't feel like you could just talk to them about any of your 
concerns or, you know, just be really open with them. If you don't, if you don't go, like when they walk into that space for a prenatal appointment, if you're not like, ah, oh, like, I'm so glad they're here. Like, I, I love being around them. Um, and some people, when I tell them that, like, does anybody feel that way with their care providers? And I will say, yes, like I have two midwives for my daughter's birth that like, I, I miss them so much mm -hmm. after they stopped coming for the home visits, they became like family. We felt so comfortable with them. Um, so, so give yourself that gift whenever possible of, you know, finding, and even if like you have insurance is fairly limiting, meet as many doctors as you can who are covered by your insurance until you find the one that you feel really safe with mm -hmm. to make a huge difference. I think those are really, really helpful, practical things to start with. With the massage, is there a specific week where, because I've read about this a lot and I'm delaying as long as possible doing it. I don't know why I'm like, fearful of it, Ooh. but I'm just curious, is it something that really is going to be like, a, as long as you start it by the third trimester, you have enough time for it to make a difference. Like what's your recommendation on that? Yeah, I tell women, if you can start around week 34, but even if okay. you don't start until week 36 of gestation and you really commit to doing it, like say at least five days a week, even if you're only doing it for like five or 10 minutes, that'll still be really helpful. So I would say definitely by week 36, start doing it ideally every day. But again, even if you can only get it in like five, five days a week, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's helpful. The other, the breathing, I think is something that is really practical in all different situations to practice. I, I know you've talked about, I can't remember if it was in one of your books or in your videos, the, I don't know, remember what it's called, but the breathing that you can do when you're eliminating, because that it just helps you like connect it's the same sort of process. Like, mm -hmm. and that one's been really helpful for me because I've also had a lot of like struggle with constipation the whole pregnancy. So that oh, is yeah, really yeah. helpful. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, you want to like almost hold your breath and like bear down, but that does not, mm -hmm. that's not going to help your diastasis recti situation either at all. So yeah, okay. that yeah. has been something I've really tried to like slow down and practice. And I mean, something you can probably practice every day. So that has been a perfect, like, just like to connect it to something I'm already doing. Right. Um, so that's another one of my favorites. So yeah, if we, if we kind of go into one of the other questions that you did write about in your book a little bit, but with the placenta, I feel like that is left out of like the whole conversation of like you birth a baby and then there's, oh wait, there's what coming next and like more. Yeah. And I, I also loved and had never heard of, um, what you talked about doing with your daughter, which was burning the cord instead of cutting. So could you talk a little bit about the placenta? Like what what that process is. I've also heard of Lotus birth, which I guess you leave them connected for a long period of time, like, which mm -hmm. seems really impractical, but maybe, yeah. I mean, I'm not quite sure. So what are your thoughts on all of that? Um, yeah. all things placenta. Yeah. So, so yeah, obviously, you know, the placenta is, it's so amazing because when that embryo implants, part of that embryo becomes the placenta, part of it becomes the baby. So it's like mm. such this like beautiful part of the process. And so essentially you're not, you're not just growing a baby, but like a fairly large organ. And, and so, yeah, the organ, it is attached to the uterus. And after the baby is born, the uterus, you will continue to have contractions, albeit much less intense than the contractions that you had when the baby was being going through the passage and, you know, being born. So don't worry, but you will continue to have contractions and these contractions help the placenta release from the uterus. And those contractions will help to essentially birth the placenta. So sometimes the placenta comes out just a couple minutes after the baby. Sometimes it takes about 30 minutes or so, and you have to do a little bit of bearing down um, or that birth breath that you were talking about to, to get the placenta out. And it's important to know that when the placenta detaches from the uterus, it leaves open blood vessels. So that's why there's a decent amount of bleeding, that vaginal bleeding after you have a baby. Um, but 
as I said earlier, your blood volume increases by about 50% when you're pregnant. So you have some extra blood to lose, so don't panic. Um, but then as the uterus continues to contract, it slowly closes off those blood vessels out as it contracts back down to size. So yeah, the placenta is birthed. It is still connected. Um, or if you're doing delayed cord clamping, meaning that you don't clamp and cut the cord immediately, uh, the cord is still connected to the baby after it comes out. And yeah, I had never heard about um, cord burning until my midwives suggested it. And so yes, typically like in the hospital, they will clamp the cord pretty close to the baby's belly button. And then with scissors, you just cut the cord off. It uh, doesn't hurt the baby at all. The baby's fine. But with this method, they had this like this box that was open. And then there was a little kind of divot on both sides and you lay the cord across it. And then you have two long tapered candles and my husband and I each held one. And so the flame was hitting the cord from both sides and it essentially carterizes the, um, the cord. And what my midwives found, and I found this to be true, they said, when you do it that way, for whatever reason, it can actually cause the cord stump that's attached to the baby's belly button to come out faster. And they think because it's carterized, it just helps it dry out a little bit faster. Um, there has not been like research on that. So <laughs> it's just pure anecdotal evidence. Um, I noticed that her cord stump came out faster than my son's. So that's a cool kind of ritual that you can do if you're at a birth center or at a home birth in a hospital, they won't let you have an open flame. So that's not an option in the hospital, but it was really special because, you know, that, that cord is this, like your main connection to the baby when they're in utero, right? Like the placenta is attached to you, the cord is, is attached to the placenta and then to the baby. So it just made us instead of just quickly cutting the cord, it made it a little bit more of a ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, the lotus birth that you mentioned, I think like in, in China, for example, in different cultures, it's more of a custom where they usually put the placenta, say like in a basket and then they salt it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't get um, rancid. And a lot of times they'll just leave it connected to the baby until the cord stump comes out, which can take like, over well over a week um and so yeah as you mentioned i assume that would be a little bit inconvenient <laughs> but but again you know it's like if it's part of your culture that's you know beautiful um and so the last um or the i'll mention two other things um so in some situations, the placenta, for whatever reason, does not come out or a piece of it stays attached. In that situation, a lot of times the, the uterus will not continue to contract back down and the woman might continue to have bleeding. In that situation, say if you're at home, the midwife actually has to go into the uterus and like get the placenta out, which can be uncomfortable. Um, in the hospital, a lot of times they can do the same thing. In some situations, they would have to do a procedure to get it out. But a lot of times it's, as long as they know what's happened, um, they can safely retrieve it. It's just uncomfortable. For me, I had a very weird slightly rare situation happened. My placenta came out, <clears throat> my midwives, they checked it, which they always do. Doctors, midwives, they check the placenta to make sure it's intact. Mine was, um, my bleeding was subsiding. They, they checked your uterus to make sure it's, you know, um, closing or make sure it's contracting back down to size. Mine was, but for three days after my daughter's birth, I was having they call them after birth pains, which typically feel like menstrual cramps. If you've already had a baby, they can be a little bit stronger. Um, but these felt like active labor contractions and they would last for like two minutes. Whereas during labor, I never had a contraction longer than 45 seconds. Mm. It was so intense, so painful. And I just thought, okay, well, I'm just having really, really, really strong after labor pains. Three days later, a piece of placenta about this big oh. came out of me. So what had happened was I grew a placental lobe separate from the placenta itself. So while yes, the full placenta came out, there was this other essentially like almost like 
tiny placenta that was still attached. And that's what my body had been working out. So Mm. I tell women, if you're having, say, and again, they were watching my bleeding and whatnot, but say, if you're having more bleeding than you think is normal, if you're having more pain than you think is normal, please tell somebody, you know, even if it does end up being totally normal, it's best to just speak up. And in my situation, it really, it must not have been that dangerous because my body obviously knew what to do. It was working it out. The bleeding was subsiding. And so my body was handling it. Okay. Um, but I wish I would have said something because maybe my pain could have been alleviated earlier. Um, and then last thing I'll say about the placenta on a positive note, there is a lot of talk about placenta um, encapsulation. Mm-hmm. And, and this is where they take the placenta. Um, it is D de- or first it is steamed and then dehydrated and then it ground up into a fine, fine powder and then put into um, pills like it's encapsulated so you can just take it like a vitamin didn't do this with my son at that time but like that sounds weird (laughs) did a lot of research about it since and and found that mainly there's just anecdotal evidence about it meaning that the research that's been done hasn't really found that it's you know really helpful but also hasn't really found that it's that harmful. Um, and some, some women will say, yeah, I took these placenta pills and it totally dried up my milk. In that case, that's not great. They wanna not take those pills. Some women find that it's life-changing. So I decided to do it with my daughter. And for me, I'm not saying this is how all women will experience it, but it was amazing. I And maybe it was just, um, the, like a placebo effect, but I almost felt euphoric Mm. after I would take these placenta pills and they lasted for about three weeks. And I swear it completely changed my experience postpartum. Mm. I had a lot of postpartum blues with my son. I didn't have any with my daughter. I almost felt like high after taking these, these pills. Um, and I think I cried when they ran out. <laughs> they so, helpful. Uh, so anyways, mm. that I, I tell women, if you want to try it, try it. And then just kind of notice how you feel afterwards. Again, if your milk supply goes down, if you just don't feel great after it, don't don't do it or just stop taking them. Um, But again, if you're curious, find somebody that has a lot of experience with placenta encapsulation, knows how to do it safely then try it. You can always, of course, talk to your, your medical care provider too about it. Mm -hmm. I think in some ways, like hearing an experience like yours with your daughter, it's like, well, it it couldn't hurt to give it a try. Cause what if that was your, the case for you, but you just don't know. And the importance of like, just tuning into your body, I think with that too, and, and not being attached to maybe if I, if I do have them and can't the placenta encapsulated, I may not even take them and being okay with that too. Like, however it turns out. Absolutely. I'm so curious because I've never heard of that happening before with the placenta with your daughter, what you described. Yeah. Is there certain conditions that would determine someone's experience with the placenta, like coming out more smoothly or things like that? Or is it kind of just, you're not going to really know how that piece is going to turn out until you're there sort of thing? One thing, and, and there's not a lot of research about this, but there's started to be some connection between the longer that you're on Pitocin the more likely it is that you might have a retained placenta, Um, which is funny because also, you know, a lot of times you'll get a shot of Pitocin in the thigh right after you have the baby to make sure that you continue to have contractions that get the placenta out. So there's not been any conclusive findings with that. That's just one thing that they've been looking into that might have a connection. Um, If, and sure, if you've already had a retained placenta, I, you typically have a higher chance of having a retained placenta again Mm -hmm. in subsequent births, um, but not always. It's not like you're guaranteed to have that same experience, but for a lot of women, we just don't know. Um, And and it's fairly rare, um, but, but it happens. And, And I like to tell women it's, it's typically okay. If they know what's happening, they, There's protocol to get it out, to make sure it's all out. So while it can be uncomfortable, you're probably going to be totally fine. Mm -hmm. So to not be too scared about it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And was that only with your second that you had that experience with the placenta? Okay. Yeah. yeah no issues with my son. Yeah. It's like, you must've had just like extra, I don't know, like nutrients or something that your body made. Oh, we have enough right? for another one. Yeah. <laughs> I've never I heard of that. So crazy. Such a mystery. I know yeah. I should have, I should have saved it and have them make like two more pills out of it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh my goodness. Well, as, as we wrap up here, cause I know I've taken a lot of your time. It's been so helpful. I could talk about it for a long time, but I'm curious at going into that early motherhood phase and postpartum, is there a question you feel like women are that you hear the most. I know you cover a lot in your book. So I'm going to definitely recommend people go pick that up. Um, that you think is really important to, to address so that we could close with. Yeah. Oh gosh. There's so many, but one that just kind of popped up was especially with first time moms, that feeling of, I don't know if I can trust my intuition. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I feel I have these instincts, but can I trust myself? And so my answer is of course, yes, you can trust yourself. You're not all like you might do something that later you look back on. You're like, Oh, I wish I would have done it that way. That's okay. We all make missteps, but ultimately the main person that knows how to care for you and your baby is you. Mm -hmm. And there is absolutely not, you know, a right or wrong way to do it, you know, so to allow yourself, and I know it's scary in the beginning to allow yourself to trust your instincts with something, this little creature that seems so vulnerable. Um, but you are so much better equipped than you realize all women you you have those instincts they are inbuilt in you even if you don't really notice them that much even if you're like questioning yourself a lot if you just kind of take a few deep breaths quiet the mind the unique right answer for you will come to you and allow yourself to to trust that and trust yourself mm -hmm. did you find that easier with your second or is it different when you have because it is a whole nother new person. Like, I, did you feel the same in, in your postpartum the second time? I felt, I felt less hesitant the second mm. time around because I think I knew like, okay, I have proof that like I kept this one child alive and like pretty healthy. <laughs> so I, I, I felt like I was more trusting with my instincts with mm -hmm. my, my daughter. And sure, like there were plenty of times where I was kind of thrown for a loop with something that didn't happen with him happening with her. So of course, like I still have plenty of moments where I'm a little bit unsure. Um, but for the most part, I feel less uncertainty this time around as I did with my son. And I feel like that is something I know for myself, like just the way that I've navigated pregnancy from a really natural perspective, I feel like you do have to lean into that because you don't have as many outsides. Like for me, I selected not to do ultrasounds. I don't have as many like hard data points to be like, the baby's okay. It's like, I intuitively feel like the baby's healthy and I'm healthy. So like, I don't need to be afraid. And I think like, I don't know what comes to parenting. That's a whole nother conversation, all the different methods and things right. I keep hearing again and again, like, like, does it feel good for you? And do you, is your baby have, you know, happy and healthy and allowing like right. your intuition, if those two things are happening, you're doing okay. You're doing good. You're, yeah. you're okay. Yeah, um, even if it doesn't fall into a specific like parenting technique or whatever, or method. Right. Yeah. So, well, Bailey, it's been so fun to chat with you and you've shared so much information. I've learned a ton, even after reading your books, I still learn more <laughs> just from this conversation. So I know other women are going to find it helpful and validating. So thank you for the work that you do. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. It was so nice to talk with you, Erica. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You take care. Yeah, you too.